Recently, Sweden and Finland's path to NATO membership has taken important steps forward. On July 5 in Brussels, the Swedish and Finnish foreign ministers signed the accession protocol, which must now be ratified by the national parliaments of the 30 NATO members. In anticipation of signing to the protocol, Sweden, Finland and Turkey had earlier signed another agreement in Madrid on June 29, by which Ankara lifted its veto on the two Scandinavian countries entering to NATO. Turkish President Erdogan's reservations were related mainly to two issues, Stockholm and Helsinki's support for the Kurdish political military movement of the Kurdistan Workers' Party, an entity deemed a terrorist by Ankara and in theory also by the European Union, and the sanctions imposed on Turkey from 2019 following its military intervention in Syria, that effectively put a freeze on weapon sales to Ankara. Meanwhile, several NATO countries, including the US and Italy, have ratified the accession protocol, but some are still missing from the roll call. These include Turkey itself, because despite the Madrid agreements, diplomacy has stalled over the fate of some suspected terrorist political refugees between Sweden and Finland, whose extradition Turkey has requested, so far always denied. At least, as far as Sweden is concerned, many of the future developments, including continued support for the PKK, will depend on the new government that was formed based on the results of the September 11 polls, which saw an exploit by the far-right anti-immigration party. But beyond Turkish resistance, the accession of the two countries to NATO still represents an unusual step in the history of the Atlantic Alliance, and if completed, could set a precedent for similar future situations. First, unlike the countries that joined the alliance in the 1990s and the 20s, our protagonists had never been considered the potential allies, despite a long and strong partnership with NATO behind them. Think of the various military exercises in the Baltic Sea, around the Swedish islands, the famous Baltops, which we have already mentioned in the video about Kaliningrad. No one expected such a situation, let alone that the two Scandinavian countries would so suddenly give up their traditional neutrality. Besides all, Sweden and Finland are still two politically and institutionally stable countries, two established and solid democracies that haven't gone through recent internal conflicts or political transition processes, unlike all those Eastern European countries that have joined the alliance in recent decades. Not to mention the efficient state of their armed forces, organized and technologically advanced, ready to integrate with NATO defense systems. This particularity would demonstrate the pure strategic purpose behind the two countries' willingness to join NATO. Their entry, therefore, is not a move designed to secure their own domestic political structure or to frame themselves in a broader international arena, but only the result of a defensive strategy against neighboring Russia. It should also be considered that none of the two countries belong to the Soviet bloc. Although significant in several aspects, their accession represents no reversal of the front, no break with the past. But precisely, a NATO enlargement in the direction of Scandinavia would certainly mark a change from the strategies adopted so far, an expansionism no longer directed eastward toward the former Warsaw Pact territories, but northward, more and more toward the Arctic which stands to be one of the crucial geopolitical scenarios for the near future. Please write below in the comments if you'd like a video on the geopolitical relevance of the Arctic. The Baltic Sea becomes a NATO sea, and considering that from now on all the Swedish islands covering the waters in front of the Kaliningrad region will to all intents and purposes be allied territories, the Russian fleet's room for maneuver will be greatly reduced. But who will ever be the biggest beneficiaries of this new NATO expansion? Well, obviously Poland and the three Baltic republics, which have always been fearful of the possible Russian actions on the Baltic. As many have noticed, it's possible that Russian retaliation will occur not so much on the land border with Finland, hostile territory for an invasion with armored vehicles and infantry, but precisely by sea or from Belarus to the three Baltic republics. Especially the Finnish one, moreover, is a respectable army that can make a decisive contribution to the alliance. Both because Finland is one of the few countries to have maintained compulsory conscription, ensuring a never ready and trained reserve, and because of the recent purchase of 64 F-35 multi-role fighter jets. No less important is the presence in Helsinki of the European Center of Excellence for Countering Hybrid Threats, a research center wanted by NATO and the European Union 
that specializes in countering hybrid threats, from cyber attacks to disinformation. All these peculiarities would make the accession process easier and shorter for Sweden and Finland, which certainly won't have to wait 10 years or so that countries like Montenegro and North Macedonia have had to wait, but so with the Baltic Sea in hand and two more friendly pawns on the chessboard. Can Europe say it's safe and secure? Mm, not yet. It's clear that finding the right military arrangement of deterrence and self-defense, considering the territorial extent of the two new entries, will take several years. Excessive militarization of the region, however, could be a gamble with unpredictable consequences, and in addition a new responsibility falls on Sweden and Finland as defenders of a border that is no longer just national but of the entire alliance. After all, one doesn't join NATO just to benefit from the clauses of the famous Article 5. Even if the maybe unjustified fear of possible Russian offensive action underlies the historic decision to renounce traditional neutrality, Sweden and Finland will have to fulfill their military obligations and spending like everyone else. Enlargement has confirmed the importance of an alliance until a few years earlier questioned by many, from Trump to Macron, but it risks getting stuck in the contradiction of its decision-making mechanisms. Indeed, NATO decisions, such as the entry of new member countries, are made by unanimity, so increasing the number of parties makes this requirement more difficult to achieve. It's one thing to get the 12 founding members to agree, it's another to find an agreement among what with Sweden and Finland would be as many as 32 different voices. Voices that are more sensitive to certain issues than others when it comes to defense. The difficult balance between Article 5 on mutual defense and the open door policy set by Article 10 would find confirmation in the very case of Sweden and Finland, motivated to protect themselves from their Russian neighbor, but geographically and politically distant and insensitive to other borders. On balance, the entry of the two Scandinavian countries into NATO would represent a military enhancement with important geopolitical consequences. First and foremost, the shift of the alliance center of gravity to the northeast could sanction a final move away from cooperation policies related to the southern and the Mediterranean fronts, leaving an equally hot sector uncovered. It's no coincidence that the new strategic concept approved at the Madrid summit didn't convince many experts, down to Mediterranean countries such as Spain. Clearly, the recent events in Ukraine have forced the NATO agenda to have a strongly East-oriented policy, and it couldn't have been otherwise, but the omen advanced by several sides, such as by Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Sánchez himself, is clear and worrying. The dangers move all around, so watch out for the South as well. In particular, what worries the Madrid government is irregular immigration from Morocco to the Melilla exclave, which is just one of many impacts of the more complex and vast problem of Western Sahara, claimed by Morocco with the approval of Spain itself. Maybe a video about it will come later. And we can't ignore the instabilities in Libya and Sahel, the gradual French retreat from Mali, and Russian interference in authoritarian governments in the region. Add to this, the the primary role that African gas and raw material deposits will play in the immediate future, not to mention investments by a giant like China, which also appears in the new strategic concept, along with Russia, in the guise of a global security threat. Beyond the Spanish demands, however, out of the Madrid summit came a picture of NATO strongly united in its intention to strengthen itself in the East, increasing its military presence on its borders with Russia by as many as 260,000 troops, from 40,000 to 300,000. At least for the time being, the Allies have also agreed on the need for the increase in military spending, which will no longer be able to consider the famous 2% of national GDP as a cap, but as a starting point. So, while Sweden and Finland are a historical exception to NATO's enlargement policies, it shouldn't be forgotten that their entry has never been considered before, and that the decision is only the result of the two national governments. NATO's attentions, however, had already for several years been directed precisely eastward not only toward Ukraine, whose membership talks were interrupted by the 2014 crisis, but toward countries such as Georgia and Moldova, which are also crossed by sensitive territorial issues. With the two new Scandinavian allies, NATO can certainly count on a strong decisive presence for the fate of the Baltic Sea, but Russian reactions are still unpredictable, and the deterrent effect that Sweden and Finland hope to achieve could generate opposite consequences. Then the question to ask is if it was actually so necessary necessary and vital for the two Scandinavian countries to break traditional neutrality. Finland seems to be the more motivated and determined of the two, with Sweden still having to deal with the power
public opinion and some political forces strengthened after the recent elections that are still opposed to joining NATO. The fact is that, despite the discordant positions, a general increase in the popularity of the NATO institution seems to be hovering in the air. And with it, the feeling that only NATO has the strength to safeguard Europe from a wide variety of global threats ends up convincing even the most skeptical about the need to return to a net bipolar model. Certainly, partnerships with external actors will be strengthened, but the example of Sweden and Finland may have sparked the broader movement and convinced other countries to get in the game and align themselves with the side, which doesn't necessarily have to match the Atlantic one. Certainly, partnerships with external actors will be strengthened, but the example of Sweden and Finland may have sparked the broader movement and convinced other countries to get in the game and align themselves with the side, which doesn't necessarily have to match the Atlantic one. Well, we are done for today. I thank you all for your attention and see you in the next video. Ciao!